Amen. As you're being seated, turn with me in the New Testament to the book of Ephesians, please. Ephesians chapter 5. Over the years that we've been together, I've preached from this text quite often because it is so, um, well, it's very apropos to our day, but it is so, it is just so relevant. It's filled with instruction and encouragement and insight, perspective. It's basically our marching orders, always has been since the Holy Spirit inspired this writing, but in these very prophetic times in which we're living, it, it surely is. And I mean, it gets right down to the gut level, personal level as well. It speaks to all of us as a church family, as you will see, but it begins by speaking at the very, very personal level. So because of that, I return here often. Now, I'm going to tell you, this is going to be one of those messages where I hope you will learn some really cool stuff. Um, and in learning that, because I love to teach while I preach, if, if, if possible, and I don't ever try to force that, but when it just comes, it's time for it to come. And you'll see what I'm saying. But, but more than just learning stuff, which is important, study to show yourself approved, able to accurately handle the word of God. So learning stuff and learning it in context, learning it correctly so we can speak it correctly is power, right? The word of God is our sword, right? Guys, we got so many people watching. Amen. Thank you. I appreciate it. Yeah. <laughs> Y'all got to help me. But it is power. But more than even that, it will come together. I pray into a climactic point of strength and power and perspective and a direct challenge to your heart and my heart and our heart. So I'm going to be building a case. Okay? Kind of reminds me of my old law enforcement days, <laughs> especially doing any kind of investigative work. You start at the basics and you start building and building and usually people can't really see where you're going with it until you get it, then you got it, then you bring it to the court and you get a conviction, right? And so I do a lot of my writing that way, those of you that have read some of my books, and, and I do a lot of the preaching and teaching that way, and this morning is that way again. So Ephesians 5. I want to start by quoting a passage of scripture. You can write it down for those of you taking notes, which I know is every single one of you. <laughs> Isaiah chapter 50, verse 2. Woe unto those who call evil good and who call good evil. Woe unto those who set darkness as light. And true light as darkness. Written 2,800 years ago, 2,700 years ago, do you think that might apply to our day as well? Yeah, we live in a fallen world. That word has always applied to every generation. The thing that makes it so prophetic and so prescient and so profound, three P words, I could do a sermon with that. Anyway, this is how my brain operates sometimes. But the thing that makes it all of that more so in our generation than any other, is the fact of the prophetic times we're living in on the other side of the return of Israel and the bursting forth of all the technology that now 24-7 darkness is called light and light is called darkness. And evil is called good. And good is called evil. And it's pumped into the hands of our children with their cell phones. It's pumped into homes on digital television and on our computers and on our tablets and laptops and, and all of that, people listening to this message some years from now, even all that will sound archaic because the technology is becoming more and more personal and more and more ingrained into our very bodies and minds with the technology that's coming. We have eaten of the tree of the fruit of the knowledge of good and evil. And a lot of things start off as good and then Satan jumps right in the middle of it 
and twists and perverts it into abject evil. The problem is he doesn't do it instantly. He does it slowly, and he gets it generation after generation after generation until finally there's a generation that's raised up that thinks that the dark things are really light. And the light things, that is those things that are good and righteous and holy, those are dark and evil. And they accept it as truth. Woe unto them. The word woe unto them, that phrase means judgment of God's coming upon them. Woe unto you. I really want to focus on this, this darkness and light, though. Pastor Greg even prayed it just a second ago. In this dark world filled with fear. See, I listen to your prayers, brother. I'm, I'm, I'm right there with you. No, but I heard you, and I'm thinking, he, he didn't have a clue where I was preaching this morning. Yet God put those words on his heart, which is the heart of what I'm going to bring to you this morning, and some revelations that are on the way for you. So hang in as I build my case. I'm also re reminded before we get to Ephesians 5, so you listen to Isaiah 52, and then also uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 14, watch this. And even Satan himself masquerades as an angel of light. Now that word angel can mean a divine being who presents himself. And it also, at its foundational meaning, meaning, is messenger. So, wrapped up in both of those, he comes from another dimension and realm. And at the same time, he brings messages. And the messages are darkness, but he wraps them in a fake light. And presents himself as one giving truth, when as a matter of fact... It is either a perverted truth. It's like rat poison. There's a lot of corn in it, but there's just enough poison to destroy you. Or it's just totally perverted, but he's got you brainwashed into, here, drink this cup of, of strychnine. It's good for you. I, people, I, I'm telling you, he knows what he's doing. He's a hunter of men's souls, and he's been doing it for thousands of years. He masquerades as an angel of light. Isn't that something? Well, how long has he been doing that? Oh, I don't know. Something like, did God really say that to you, Eve? You shall not die. If you would do what I say, you can live forever. You could be like us. You could be like the gods. You can be like God himself. Here, eat. What was he? A messenger? Of a fake light. It was really darkness and it brought with it death. But it was so wrapped and it was so beautiful and tempting. And it wasn't an apple, it wasn't a piece of fruit. I've got books written about it. But it was so enamoring. And it was going to give them some knowledge of things that only the angelic realm and God's throne had, they thought. Even they were seduced by it. Satan's pretty powerful, is he not? Yeah, we don't, and we don't need to make light or make fun of that power. He is not God. Far, far from that. But he's far, far above us as far as what he knows, the dimensions in which he can operate, and how he can manipulate us. He can't read our minds, I do not believe, but he doesn't have to. He watches our lives. He's like the ultimate deer hunter. He watches us, he studies us until he knows exactly the trap that we will step into. I always think of this as a, as a deer hunter. Wherever it's legal to bait deer and wherever I've hunted that way, I've always been amused how a deer can walk through a forest of pine trees, see a pile of corn, and think there's nothing wrong with that picture. Oh, they might think something's wrong with it, but you know the temptation to go to a big sweet pile of yellow corn that might even been spiked with honey. <laughs> the temptation is just too much. And it costs them their life. When I'm shooting, some of you it doesn't, but but okay. You got all of that. Woe unto you who call things that are light and good and righteous, you call that evil. In other words, woe unto you who call the word of God evil. 
And woe unto you who call the word of this world system. That's good. Woe unto you. God's judgment is coming upon these things. Are you with me? And those who call light darkness, and those who call darkness light, woe unto you. Okay. Why is that? Well, let's start our journey in Ephesians 5. Turn there with me. Verse 1, we'll read the first 20 verses. You've seen this before, hopefully. I know I've preached on it a lot. Some of you are newer to this church family. Some of you are brand new in the Word. Ephesians chapter 5. Here are our marching orders. So then be imitators of God, therefore. And you know what that means. It doesn't mean we cannot be God, but yet we represent him. It's like we tell our children when they leave home, especially young teenagers, as they're just kind of getting out. Maybe they've got their driver's license, or maybe you're allowing them to get out with groups and friends a little more now. One of the things, you might not say it in these words, but I know I was told it in these words. Remember who you represent. Remember whose you, who's you are. You represent this family. You represent our name and and your grandparents and everybody else that has this name, remember who you belong to. That's what the Word is telling us. As we step into this life of darkness and fear and, 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 and light being called dark and dark being called light and good being called evil and evil being called good and all of it brought by the messenger of darkness who presents himself as light, he says, remember who you belong to. Remember who you're representing. So there, imitate. Imitate his character, his nature. You cannot, you're not God. You're not going to be God, but you can represent him. Amen, church? Amen. Okay, that's the context. Be imitators of God, therefore, as dearly loved children. And live a life of love. Just as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us as a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. That doesn't mean we can't defend ourselves. It doesn't mean that we have to walk through life holding uh, uh, daisies and tulips and tiptoeing through the tulips. It, you know, J Jesus didn't live like that. I do recall him making a whip and marching right up to the temple. How about y'all? And other things, <laughs> you know. But, but, but the point is, even, even that was done in love. Oh, the people that are wrapped up in the darkness of the world didn't see it that way. It was love for this father's house. It was love for the, for, for the house of prayer. It was love for righteousness. It was love for what is right and light. And it was love for the people who were getting caught up in the perversion of what was happening in the temple in his day. And out of love, he started setting it straight. So to live a life of love, don't get a picture in your mind of this, you know, kind of hippified, you know, whatever you want to call it, just walking around, say, oh, I just love you, love you, love, love everything, love everything. <laughs> it's, that's not what it means. But it means there's a certain self-sacrificial way that we present ourselves in the world. We look for ways to bring ministry and kindness into other people's lives, if they will let us. There's some people who are so mean and ornery, they won't even let us, and we just have to shake the dust off our feet. Who said to do that? Jesus. And keep going. Keep going. Look for others to love. Does that make sense? All right, so be imitators of God as dear children. All right? And then live a life of love as Christ did. And then gave himself up for us as a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. The, the ultimate act of love, self-sacrifice. I right, keep going. But among you, now here's where the water hits the wheel. Day in and day out. Living for the Lord's not about perfection because nobody can do it perfectly every second of every day. But it is about direction. And here's the direction. Among you, there must not even be a hint of sexual immorality. You say, what does that mean? Well, sexual immorality means anything that goes against the nature and heart of God regarding how we use our bodies. That's, that's what it means. And, you know, we've got children here and everything. I'm not going to go down through the whole list and, and everything. But, but our world is inundated with sexual immorality and temptations to be a part of it. Amen. Thanks.
not even a hint of it, or of any kind of impurity. And then some examples are given of greed, because these, these things are improper for God's holy people. And holy means separate, just separate. We belong to the Lord. We're imitators of God. We're separating from ourselves from the world. We don't call light darkness and darkness light. For God's holy people, next verse, nor should there be any obscenity, foolish talk, coarse joking, which are out of place, but rather thanksgiving. I learned a long time ago, and it's not just here, it's just everywhere I go. I get in a crowd, and, and, and every now and then somebody will say, hey, hey, preacher, I got a joke for you. And, and used to in the old days, I'd say, tell it to me. And they'd tell it, and I'd, just, I'd say, you know, I can't believe you just told your preacher that joke. I mean, not that I'm Mr. Holy or like, you know, but it's like, you know, what do you want me to do with that? You want me to laugh, and therefore you can tell everybody the preacher laughed at it? Because, I mean, so I've had some people tell some pretty nasty stuff, but they thought it was funny. And in the flesh, it was funny. But why would you tell your preacher that? I, I mean, again, not that I'm the representation of everything holy, but I mean, I, I am your pastor and try to be a man of God. So I've learned a long time ago, people come, hey, preacher, and I don't mind. I love good jokes. I love humor. And people come up and say, hey, preacher, I got a joke for you. My first thing I say is, can I tell it from the pulpit and put your name on it? <laughs> well, no, no, then I don't want to hear it. I mean, how about that? See, we got, we got, and, and, and I didn't really trash them. I kind of make a joke out of it, you know, but they get the point. And that, that's, what, that's, that's what the word's telling us here. Just don't get caught up in stuff that, that's impure and nasty and coarse and just not proper. You wouldn't tell it in the pulpit. You wouldn't stand up here before you sang a song like Gay just did and say, hey, before I sing, I got a joke. And then tell, <laughs> you, you wouldn't do it. And the word of God says, then don't do it out there either. Amen? Amen. Okay. Look, here's why. Verse 5. For of this you can be sure, no immoral, impure, or greedy person, such a man as an idolater, has any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and of God. And let no one deceive you with empty words. For because of such things, God's wrath comes upon those who are disobedient. Therefore, do not be partners with them. Now listen, do not mistake what this word means. If you hear it in its context, in the way it was worded purposely. Paul is writing to the church. He's writing to Christians. And he's saying, don't even have a hint of sexual immorality in your life. Don't even flirt with it. Don't let people, don't let people even see that in your life. Don't, don't, don't make filthy talk and coarse joking who you are. People see you coming and they're looking for a coarse joke from you. Don't, don't, don't do that. Live a life of love as much as you possibly can in all of its, all of its aspects. You know, sometimes it's love to pull somebody out of a burning fire, right? Sometimes it's love to take a drug addict to an, a rehab center when they don't want to go, right? So there's many aspects to love. But live a life of love. Guard your heart and your mind. Know who you represent. You're part of the family of God. You're one of his dear children. And keep the perspective that if you stumble and fall, get it right because you are God's child. You don't lose your salvation because you slip up in one of these things. That's not what he's saying. He says, he's saying you. But the reason he was saying this to the church is because Christians struggle with this too in the flesh. But we have the Holy Spirit who ministers to us, who speaks to us, who convicts us. Can I get an amen? Amen. And, 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 and who guides us into truth and, and, and tells us in our mind in this ear right here, you know, you know better than that get that right. You represent my kingdom. Right? Have you ever heard that? Okay. And then the, the, the perspective is always remember that even if you allow yourself to be a part of this, there are going to be consequences. You're not going to lose your salvation. You're God's child. But he's saying, remember, I'm bringing my wrath on the unbelieving world for these things. Why do you want to go out here and act like an unbelieving world just so you can get the unbelieving world to like you on Facebook, for example? Or to help or to let you sit at their cool kids' table. He says, don't do that. 
Don't be like them. Be separate from them. All right? Now, that doesn't mean that we don't have relationships with lost people. you got to if you're going to live in the world, and God wants us to because why? We represent, how else are they going to hear or see the gospel in action if maybe we're not around them? But it does mean don't be yoked with them, unequally yoked. Another passage just Scripture tells us in Corinthians that is locking ourselves almost like a, a deep relationship because oftentimes that darkness, because we have a fallen nature, can overshadow the light. Not saying we lose our salvation, but I'm saying we can get in some deep darkness. We can wallow in the pig pen. And a lot of that mess will follow behind us. Amen, church? Okay, there's the perspective. You see this darkness and light, darkness and light. Now keep watching, keep watching. All right, so here's the next verse. Verse 8. Because you, he's talking to the church, Christians, believers, professing believers. You were once, you notice it doesn't say in darkness, you were once darkness, but now you are not in light. You are light in the Lord. Does this make sense? Now, there's a perspective for you. Well, I used to be walking in darkness. No, you used to be darkness. All the way back to John three sixteen. For God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son. Whosoever believes in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. But whoever does not believe is condemned already. And here is the verdict. Light has come into the world, but men love darkness rather than light. You see, it's all through the scriptures. Are you following me? Listen to this. You once were darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Live as children of light, for the fruit of the light consists in all goodness, righteousness, and truth. And find out what pleases the Lord. How are we going to do that? The word of God, prayer, praise, fellowship with other believers. And have nothing to do with the fruitless deeds of darkness, but rather expose them. Doesn't mean going around like a jerk and do it, and, you know, but it just, just don't be afraid to say what's right and what's wrong according to God's word. I'm telling you, I've taught you this before. Many of you do this, and I do it as well. You don't have to be intimidated by speaking the truth of God's word, especially if somebody asks you a question. Well, what do you believe about? And then they'll throw their latest political correctness out there that you know is godless. And my, my first answer is, what I believe is what God's contextual word says. Now, do you still want to know what I believe? If they say yes, they've given you permission to tell them what the word of God says. See, because the bottom line is, Bottom, bottom line, it doesn't matter what Carl thinks about anything. Bottom, bottom line, now hopefully Carl's going to be a good messenger of the truth, and I think what God thinks, but what if I'm off by what God thinks a little bit? Who wins, me or God? Yeah, that's why I say that it ultimately doesn't matter what I think. So I start by telling people that I, I think what God thinks contextually in his word. That's my worldview. Oh, you're one of those. I say, well, what are you? You've got a worldview too. You're one of those. You're the one that asked me the question. Do you want to hear my answer? I don't want to hear nothing out of the Bible, but then you don't want to hear my answer. When you're ready for it, let me know. Boy, it's a beautiful day, isn't it? Let's go fishing. That's how you do it. And you'd be surprised <laughs> what God will do from there. But here we are. Rather expose them. For it is shameful even to mention what the disobedient, that word means the lost, those that have no care for the things of God's word, what they do in secret. And everything exposed by the light becomes visible. For it is the light that makes everything visible. This is why it is said, and this is in Isaiah, by the way, chapter 26. Wake up, O sleeper. Rise from the dead and Christ will shine on you. You know what? Boy, that speaks to hashtag woke, doesn't it? Wake up, those of you who are calling light, darkness, and darkness, light, and good, evil, and evil, good. Wake up, you call yourself hashtag woke, you are hashtag asleep, and you are dead in Christ, you are darkness, you are not awake, get really awake in Jesus Christ, and come to the light. You can give the Lord a hand. We need to turn that into a meme somehow and put that all over social media. I mean, that's what that is. All right, look at that. So, so then here we go. Here we go. So we've got all this instruction. Now watch this. So be careful then how you live, not as unwise, but as wise. See, that's where a lot of God's children get in trouble. 
just like children in our families. We love them. We're not going to kick them out of the family and take their name away and all of that. But sometimes they can mess up so bad because of their lack of wisdom. And then they carry stuff behind them for the rest of their life. We love them. It breaks our hearts. We pray for them. We try to give them all the help we can. But this is God's warning to us, his children, as we're living for the Lord in this crazy, dark world that says all of the darkness is light. All of the evil, it is good, you idiots, it's good. All the way back to the Garden of Eden. Can you hear the serpent speaking? Nachash, Satan. Be very careful then, verse 15 says. Be very careful then how you live, not as unwise but as wise, making the most of every opportunity because the days are evil. Can I get an amen? All right, well, see, the days have always been evil since the Garden of Eden, then since the flood, and right up to now. But what's the difference? We're living in the most prophetic time since the first coming of Jesus Christ. Israel's back. Jerusalem's back. The nations are aligning. Wars and rumors of wars breaking out everywhere. All of the evil, the filth. Now it's 24-7 information communication technologies that pump evil all over the world, all over. It just, it's, it's, well, I started to get really graphic and say it's like somebody throwing up on you, but I will not say that. <laughs> That's too graphic. But not just you, but on your children. And then they come home smelling like it and looking like it and think it smells good. That's what's happening, guys. And God's word says, these days are evil. You're living in days now that are prophetic. I'm saying that. I'm not reading. I'm just looking at this because these days are evil. We're living the most prophetic times since the first coming of Jesus Christ. No generation before us has ever lived with so much evil being thrown up all over them every minute of every day. No generation before us. None. And most of that started happening just a decade or so ago. Most of it. And there's more to come. Way more to come. Are you hearing me? Okay. Verse 17. Therefore do not be foolish, but understand what the Lord's will is. How are we going to do that? Well, Bible study, in the word, reading, praying, ministering together, uh, coming, coming to the studies, coming to men's Bible study, women's Bible study when you can. Uh, our women's conference, uh, uh, amazing this weekend. Uh, just a hundred and something women were all a part of that. What a powerful thing. Men's conference coming up, those kinds of things. Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night, and our classes and our sanctuary teaching. I mean, that's how we're going to get to know what God's will is, studying his word, speaking speaking it back and forth to each other, singing it, praising it, uh, living it, in, ad administering it in, in hands-on, in feet-on-the-ground ministry and missions. Does all of that make sense? Understand what God's will is. How can I know God's will? First, you start in the Word. How about that? Well, I don't understand it all. Then work on the things you do understand. There was a great preacher one time who says, the parts of God's word that scare me are not those parts that I don't understand. They are the parts that I do understand. <laughs> you understand what I'm saying? Okay. All right. Then it says, but look at this. Verse 19. So speak to one another. You want to speak to each other? Don't do it in coarse joking and filth and immorality and flirting around with it. Men treat women in the church like your daughters, your granddaughters, your sisters. I mean, that's what the Bible says. Women do the same thing with the young men and treat each other as family. Don't be flirting around with all of this filth that the world says is okay. It will bite you. That serpent will bite you. He will present himself as light, but he is dark and he's looking. You're the deer walking into a pile of corn. Amen. You will get a 30 ought 6 through your brain. So therefore, here's how we are to speak to each other. Do it with psalms, hymns, spiritual songs. Sing and make music in your heart to the Lord, always giving thanks to God the Father for everything in the, in the, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ and and, to, and submit to each other out of your reverence for Jesus Christ. That submit doesn't mean we bow down and do anything anybody tells us. It just means be humble before each other and minister to each other. And somebody needs help, you help them. Then when you need help, they'll help you. And just 
submit yourself to each other because you first submitted to Jesus Christ. Amen. And then I love the rest of that. We don't have time for it where it says, now husbands, here's how you're to submit. Wives, here's how you're to submit. Then it speaks directly to husbands and wives. And then Paul ends that by saying, now really what I'm talking about is the church. Marriage is to be a picture of the church. See how all of that fits together? All right. So I started with Isaiah 50. We went to 1 Corinthians chapter 11 about, well, Isaiah 50, woe unto you. And 1 Corinthians chapter 11, Satan masquerades as an angel of light. I brought you right into one of the most uh, powerful passage, passages about light and darkness and who we are and who Jesus is and generally how we are to walk through this every day, what our marching orders are. We're representing God. We're representing him. Be careful what we do with our minds, our bodies. Be careful what we do with our mouth and what we speak. And be careful how we treat each other and examine our hearts. Is our love real? Is it biblical? Is it pure? Don't flirt with anything that's not pure and call it love. Don't be doing that. Treat each other with respect. And then, and then let's speak words of kindness to each other. And by the way, when it comes time, let us sing and praise and join with each other in singing and praising. And like I said this morning, if you can't sing, shout the words out. <clears throat> I can sing, not really well, but I can, but because I have to do so much speaking, I try to save my voice. So what do you hear me do a lot up here? I'm shouting out the words, right? Just a few phrases here and there punctuating with scripture, you know? I'd love to be able to sing every word that everybody sings to the top of my voice because I love to sing. But, but, but I'm not able to do that and preach and then come back and preach and then go this week and preach. I just, my voice won't hold up to that. So, so what do I do? I, I, I speak the word and I shout the word even while we're singing. See, that's, that's how... That's how we keep our mind and our lives in perspective. It doesn't make me perfect. I still struggle with my flesh just like you do, but the Holy Spirit screams in my ear just like he does yours. And if it's awfully hard to, to, to be against the Holy Spirit and the, when, when you're speaking the name of Jesus, <laughs> when, when you're singing songs of Jesus, when you've got his music playing, even if you can't sing it in, in your car, in your home, does that make sense? And that's what Ephesians 5 says, so we were there. All right, now, follow me. Watch this. This is going to sound like it's not connected, but I promise you in a powerful way it will, and it will connect to your life. All right, so you know all of these principles now. <clears throat> now, let's do this. Do you know where the first time the word Hebrew is found in the Bible? See, we've been learning Hebrew this morning. Baruch, Hashim, Adonai, Yeshua, HaMashiach. Do you know where the word Hebrew is first spoken? I, you, you don't have to answer out loud, and I'm not trying to embarrass anybody. It's, it's in God's Word, of course. It's in the first book. It's in the book of Genesis, and it's in Genesis 14. Now, Abraham has already been called of God before then. Back in chapter 11 and then chapter 12, we hear Abraham's call. We'll talk about that in just a moment because it's important to what we're going to say. And it all ties into what we've been saying. But in chapter 14, we hear that he's called Abraham the Hebrew. And then from that point forward, we hear the word Hebrew quite often, especially in the Old Testament and in the New Testament too. <clears throat> I'll, tell you, <clears throat> excuse me, I'll tell you what that word means a little later on, but that's where we hear it. And so Abraham the Hebrew <clears throat> was called out of some place. Remember what the scripture says? I got to get me some water, guys. Do you, you remember what the scripture says where he was called out from? Yeah. Ur. Of the Chaldees. Ur, from among the Chaldeans. From Ur of the Chaldees. Ur, a place, a city of the Chaldees. All right. Abraham the Hebrew called out of Ur of the Chaldees. To do what? 
And God was going to take him someplace. He was going to take him to what we now know as the promised land. And he was going to show it to him. He's going to say, here, I'm going to make you into a great nation. And here, you're going to bless the whole earth. But first, Abraham, the Hebrew, was taken from Ur of the Chaldees. Now, let me tell you about that word Chaldean just a minute. Throughout the Old Testament, you will find it used interchangeably, therefore synonymously, <laughs> with the word Babylon or Babylonian. Interesting, when Isaiah wrote Isaiah 50, woe to those who call it evil good and good evil and darkness for light, he was also warning the people of Israel that the Chaldeans, the Babylonians, were just over those hills and they were ready to be unleashed if God removed his hand and they would come down and sweep them away. These were God's people. Because why? They were calling darkness light and light darkness. And they were calling good evil and evil good. And Isaiah was warning them, God's judgment's going to come on you if you don't cut that out. But they wouldn't cut it out. And the Chaldeans sweep down upon them, swept down upon them. Now, now, now wait a minute. So, but Abraham, the Chaldeans, that was, that was way before Babylon. I mean, you know, Joseph and all those guys hadn't been born and the Pharaohs and slavery in Egypt and coming out of Egypt and, you know, and 400 years in slavery. And then finally the tribes are set and the, under the judges and then finally King Saul and then King David and King Solomon. I mean, <laughs> hundreds and hundreds of years before Abraham, he's called out of Ur of the Chaldees, but there was no Babylonian empire then. Are y'all following me? This is going to be important what I'm getting ready to tell you. There was no Babylonian empire, therefore no Chaldean empire, but there were Chaldeans. They were an ancient Semitic people that lived down in the same area of what we would call Iraq and Iran now, where the Babylonian empire would establish its basic thrusting of a headquarters hundreds of years later. But they were like tribes, if you will, tribal people. Nomads, but they, they settled down in those areas and they became very strong. But by the time the Assyrians arose, the Chaldean people had to deal with that empire. And, and then finally the Babylonians began to, to grow and then they conquered the Assyrians. But the Chaldeans were still right in the middle of that whole mix. And they became synonymous with the Babylonians because they kind of assimilated into the culture and by intrigue and all kinds of things, they worked their way into places of government. And by the time we get to God's judgment coming upon Israel, the king that conquered them, what's his name? He was Chaldean. He was one of the greatest kings of the Chaldean dynasty of the nation of Babylon. Are you following me? Now, who were the Chaldean people when they were tribal people? They were known as people of utter wickedness in those days. They were known for their magic, their astrology, their sorcery, their witchcraft, and their demonic worship and idolatry. I mean, they were so thick in it. They grabbed darkness and ate it for breakfast and lunch and dinner and called it good. These were wicked people. So by the time we get to Daniel's day, when they're carried off into captivity, who's ruling? Nebuchadnezzar, the greatest king of the Chaldean dynasty. What does he immerse those boys in? The ways of the Chaldeans and the Babylonians. He changes their name to the names of their gods, Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego. Those are not their real names. Those are not their Hebrew names. He changes. Then he wants to teach them the ways of magic and sorcery and all of that. And they refuse to participate in that. But you remember Daniel, many times he's called upon by these kings down through the years to come interpret dreams because they began to call him, here's a man that listens to God. They don't say the gods because he's a testimony in their midst. Are you all with me? Now, this is important. I'm building to something, and it's going to be about you and me. That's who the Chaldeans were. Abraham was called out of Ur of the Chaldeans. See, so before Babylon, Abraham was living in, in that, in Ur, what was around it. Witchcraft, sorcery, magic, filth, sexual immorality, demon worship. He was called out of Ur. Of the Chaldeans. Do you know what Ur means in the ancient Semitic language? Light. 
Think a minute. He was living in a city called the light of the Chaldeans. There was no light in them. They were darkness. What did they call themselves and their city? We are the light. Who do you think was behind that? Satan, who even masquerades as an angel of light. And woe unto them who call light dark and dark light. Are you following me? Go all the way to the New Testament. Have nothing to do with darkness. You used to be darkness, but now you are light. If you were to speak it in the ancient Semitic language, you'd say, now you are Ur, except you're the real Ur. God called Abraham and his family out of Ur of the Chaldeans. You know what Hebrew means? The word Hebrew, in Hebrew, its root basic meaning is this. One who has crossed over from the other side. It's in the Hebrew dictionaries. I asked Messianic Rabbi Zev Peret about it. He said, that's exactly what it means. Get this. That word is Eber, Ebar, which is where we kind of, we get it to Hebrew. Ebar in Hebrew. Do you know what the word Abraham comes from Ebar? They, they, they come from the same word. And Abraham means Abraham, Abraham, and it means he who comes from the other side. He who comes from the other side has crossed over. If you say Abraham, the Hebrew. Are you with me? He who comes from the other side has crossed over, and I'm going to keep preaching, from darkness to light. And he did it in obedience to God. He did it willingly, and he went far away from it. He separated himself from it. He went up, and then God says, now let me show you. And he took him down into what would become the promised land. He showed him the whole land. He said, this will be yours and your descendants, and out of your descendants will come a seed, and out of your seed the whole earth will be blessed. And it would be through him that the nation of Israel would be born, that the prophets would come, that the word of God would be born, that the prophecies of Christ would come, that the Christ would come, and out of the Christ would come the old rugged cross that we sing about about and celebrate out of that would come the resurrection that we say our victory is in Jesus why because he's raised from the dead out of that would come the birth of the church and how was it birthed by the giving of the Holy Spirit out of that would come our power and our strength to live daily in a world full of darkness and to be the light and now the gospel has been preached for 2,000 years you're blessed I'm blessed our families are blessed people all over the world are being blessed because of it because Abraham crossed over from the darkness to the light he came out of Ur of the Chaldees he put it behind him and he said yes Lord and God says I will birth in you and through you something you can't even imagine and some of it you won't even live in the flesh but your descendants will live and it'll be because of you and one day in 2022 in the country swamps of a little church on the east side of Milton a preacher is going to be exalting your name and your faith the greatest preacher this world has ever seen. No, 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 God didn't say that. <laughs> no, Lord have mercy. He didn't say that. I'm just saying God knows all of that. He knew all of that. Thank you, brother. He would, he would, he, he knew you. He knew. He knew Abraham. He knew his heart didn't belong to that darkness. I'm sure Abraham got caught up in it. Abraham wasn't an angel or a saint. You can even read of his life in the scriptures that when he came out of it, he still struggled from time to time. He got caught up in some little fibs. Y'all remember? But overall, he was a good man and he loved God and God walked with him literally in the flesh a few times. I mean, that's what God wants is a relationship with us, but he can't if we're walking in darkness. And that's what the book of, of Ephesians was telling us. Cross over. Be the one known as he who came, she who came out of that. Cross over because God's got something he wants to birth in you. God's got some places he wants to take you. 
God's got some things he wants to do in you that you can't even imagine and that you will eat the fruit of and enjoy, but even your children and your grandchildren and your great-grandchildren and your great-great-grandchildren, if the Lord tarries, they will eat of that same fruit because of you. If you don't believe it, go back and read the account of Abraham. Does all of this make sense? Don't answer out loud. I'm asking rhetorically. So what are you going to do with it? If you're here this morning, you've never surrendered your life to Jesus Christ, then this morning's this morning. Today is the day of salvation. Today is the day to cross over. You can even call yourself a Hebrew in the truest sense of how that word is used, not trying to pretend like, well, I'm going to pretend like I'm a Jewish person or a Hebrew. But that's, that's not what that is. He, it, it's an adjective. It describes somebody. It describes him, Abraham, the Hebrew. Abraham. Uh, uh, a, a, Ivar Rahim, the Ivar, the man who walked away from it, has crossed over. This morning could be the morning for somebody here, man, woman, boy, or girl, to cross over because the Bible says that if you haven't come to Jesus, you're already condemned. Not because of God, because of you in this world and our fallen flesh. God's the one there with the rugged cross. He's the one saying, I can save you out of that. You can be restored to what it was supposed to be, but you've got to choose. You're not an animal. You're not a puppet on a string. You're not a robot. You have to choose. Like Abraham didn't have to come, but he did. He chose to cross over. He chose to leave it behind, and he came, and I blessed him. And I want to bless you. So somebody here this morning needs to come and to be blessed and to be saved. There's somebody here this morning that needs to come back to the Lord because you've been in the pig pen out there and you're a prodigal and you need to come back. Others of you that need to come out of areas of darkness in your life. I'm not judging you. I, I'm not even thinking of a person, I promise. But I just know it's out there and therefore it's got to be in here too. And People struggle with every kind of darkness there is. And today is the day you're hearing the truth of God's word. Woe unto you if you keep calling it good. It will bite you and it will destroy you. You've got to come out. You've got to leave it behind. Because I want to birth some holy things in you. And then for God's people, those of us that just every day, we know we're born again. We know we're serious about our faith in Christ. But every day we look at this world and we say, man, this world looks like it's falling apart. It is. This world looks so evil. It is. Look at all the death and destruction and war and disease and epidemics and pandemics. It shouldn't be like this. It shouldn't. My hope is not this way forever. It won't be. I pray that God's going to fix this. He has and he will. Well, then what am I doing here in the midst of it? You're an ambassador. Ambassador for the kingdom. You're Noah building the ark and shouting to the people the flood is coming. You're Lot standing in the doorway of your home looking at the Sodom and Gomorrah that you're living in and you're telling the people around you, please don't do this. Please don't do this. You can be saved. You can be saved because the fire of God is coming. The flood of God's wrath is on its way. We're the lots. We're the Noahs. That's what we're doing here. But in the meantime, God can't birth stuff in us if we're still in Ur of the Chaldees. To this day in the modern Hebrew language, Chaldean is pronounced Kasadim. Kasadim. Brother Zev taught me this. You need to get his, well, hey, hey, I forgot. He's got a new book coming out here about May or June. It's called Unmasking the Chaldean Spirit. So he'll take you deep into these truths. You need to get that book when it comes out. I'm just telling you. Not here to sell a book. I'm just telling you. That's where you're going to get the, you know, even deeper into it than this. But kas, kasdim is the Hebrew word. It means Chaldean as of the people and the ancient peoples that conquered them and everything and, and took them off into captivity under Nebuchadnezzar, the, uh, the Chaldean dynasty of the Babylonian Empire. But 
But kastim is used today in modern Hebrew to speak of demons, evil, spirits, ghosts, filth. The, the kastim. The kastim. A little child might say, Mommy, I saw a kastim. You know, that's how they use it. Like, I saw a demon, I saw a ghost, I saw something filth. To this day, that's the legacy of the Chaldean spirit. God told Abraham, get out of that. Abraham said, thy will be done. And he was called from then a Hebrew, the one who crossed over. Some people here need to cross over this morning. We're going to sing an invitation hymn in just a few moments. We'll sing.